So, welcome back to the lecture series on bioenergetics of life processes. So, today is the fourth lecture of the third week, lecture 4 of uh, week 3. So, W3, L4 and this is in summary, this is lecture 14. Okay. So, as of now, we talked about the history, historical the discoveries. So, we talked about the discovery of oxygen. So, as you remember, H2O plus CO2 making CH2O, which is carbohydrate plus oxygen. So, oxygen is getting liberated was discovered by Joseph Priestley and this process needs light which was said by Jan Eigenhaus. John Senebier showed that this process needs carbon dioxide that was the discovery of Joe Senebier and followed by that, followed by Joe Senebier's discovery the distinctive contribution was to show that the fixed air namely CO2 is taken up in photosynthesis. The role of water in photosynthesis was demonstrated by Theodore de Saussure. So, role of water by Theodore Saussure figured out the role of water. And the final contribution to the basic equation of photosynthesis came nearly a half century later by a gentleman called Julius Meyer, Julius Robert Meyer, Julius Robert Meyer. So, Julius Robert Meyer discovered the law of conservation of energy in 1842 and Meyer recognized that plant convert solar energy into chemical free energy. Solar energy into chemical free energy. The reason to tell you the history is that you must have been realizing that now if you are going by the Julius Meyer statement, the plant take in one form of power that is light and produce another power which is chemical or the chemical difference. So, what I wanted to highlight here is pretty early, much earlier during 18th century itself, the concept of bioenergetics in the life processes, what we are discussing today through these lectures took its root. People are realizing that there is a perennial source of energy stream of light which is coming, which is making this life form survive. So, it means the whole spectrum of life, the whole uh, distinctness of the ecosystem which is surviving. There is a continuous flow of energy and this flow of energy and leading to transformation of energy. Essentially, this is what is contributed. Why these contributions are becoming textbook is there is a transformation, solar energy to chemical free energy. Okay. For Julius Robert Meyer to tell that so early, that tells that these concepts of bioenergetics have continuously getting imbibed 
what we are formally studying today. Okay. Now, if you look at uh, the nature's uh, spectrum, the amount of energy stored by photosynthesis is enormous, more than 10 to the power 17 kilocalorie of free energy stored annually by photosynthesis on earth, 10 to the power 17 kilocalorie of free energy is annually stored. Okay. Stored annually by photosynthesis on the floor of earth, which corresponding correspond to assimilation of more than 10 to the power 10 tons of carbon into carbohydrates and other form of plus other form of organic matter. So, just this number itself tells you how unique this process is that which has evolved through billions of years and it has learned to you know, transform the huge amount of carbon sources into much more meaningful, much more organized structure. So, this is where you see there is an creating an order or uh, the old thing what I have mentioned in the previous classes self assembly and this is where the free energy comes into play. Now, next thing what we are going to discuss is the chlorophyll trapped solar energy. So, you need that first source who has the ability to tap trap solar energy. So, R O chlorophyll traps solar energy. So, going by Meyer's words, nature has put itself the problem of how to catch in flight light streaming into the earth and to store the most elusive of all power in the rigid form. What is the mechanism of trapping this most elusive of all powers which is your solar power? How to trap it? The first step is the absorption of light by photoreceptor molecules. Photo or light. Okay photoreceptor molecules. Okay. The, the principal photoreceptor is the in the chloroplast of most green plant is called chlorophyll C H L O R O chlorophyll. A substituted tetrapyrrole and we will come to that what does that mean. Uh, substituted tetrapyrrole. So, if you look at the structure of chlorophyll which is essentially the four nitrogen atom of the pyrrole are coordinated to a magnesium atom. Four nitrogen atom of the pyrrole are, this is a coordinated compound. 
as soon as I draw the structure, it will make sense. Coordinate it to a magnesium atom. Okay. Now, let us put the structure in place, which will make more sense is these are the four nitrogen which are making a complex with magnesium sitting in the center and these nitrogen are connected okay Okay, now okay, and then you have okay. Now you have these nitrogen. So, what I said, four nitrogen atom of the pyrroles are coordinated to a magnesium. So, this is where the four pyrrole nitrogen, this is nitrogen, this is that second, this is the third, this is the fourth, and this is the coordination what it is doing. Then you have out here, you have a R group, which is which varies that R group varies for chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B the molecule which is trapping the sunlight which is minus CH3 in chlorophyll A and minus CHO in chlorophyll B okay and you have CH2 and CH3 out here then you have another CH3 out here and there is one small mistake I did while drawing this. Let me just correct it one second. There is a small mistake. Okay. This is this is the mistake I did. Okay. Okay. This is where your oxygen is connected. This is where you have the CH3, which is connected. And out here, you have a slightly tight because I have to draw it in a OCH3. And you have a hydrogen here and out here on this third ring if you look at it if I number them 1, 2, 3 and 4. So, if you in that context if you look at here this is CH with CH2 here you have CH3 here you have CH3 and H and here you have CH2, CH2, O, O, O and there is an R group. I will talk about the R group, what that R group is. This, this R group we will talk later. It is a complex structure. It is taking a bit of a time really put it across. Okay. That is pretty much is the structure. So, you have a magnesium sitting at the center. Now, that R group what I mentioned is equal to you have CH2, CH, C, CH3 
then you have CH2, then you have CH2, CH2, CH, CH3, CH2, CH2, CH, CH2, CH2, and then you have a CH here, and then you have the methyl group attached to it, CH3. Okay. So this is basically the form, formula for chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. Now, another distinctive feature of chlorophyll is the presence of a phytol, a highly hydrophobic 20 carbon alcohol esterified to an acid side chain. Okay. So you see there is a phytol group which is present and chlorophyll B differs from chlorophyll A is having a formyl group in place of a methyl group on one of the pyrroles. So this is what I wanted to highlight about chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. And apart from it, chlorophylls are very effective photoreceptor because they contain a network of alternating single and double bonds. So if you look at this whole structure, this is what is the beauty of these kind of structures. They have a lot of single and double bonds. So if, you, if I start putting all the bonds out here, so this is a double bond, this is a double bond, this is a double bond, this is a double bond. So these kind of structures in nature are invariably are very good light trapping agents. So most of the people who synthesize these kind of molecules rely on this factor to have an alternate single and double bond structure which helps them to you know obtain this kind of uh, alternating single and double bond and such compounds are called polyenes. So this is a word for that su such alternate single and double bonded structure. These are called polyenes. Okay. So they have a very strong absorption band in the visible region of the spectrum where the solar output reaching the earth also is maximal. The peak molar absorption coefficient of chlorophyll A and B are higher than 10 to the power 5 centimeter among the highest observed of among the organic molecules. And if I draw the spectra of it, the spectra is something like this. So absorption coefficient coefficient which is starting at 400 in the visual region 500, 600, 700 and this is around 10 to the power 5. Now if you look at chlorophyll A, chlorophyll A's absorb absorbance is something like this, 400 then it falls down, this is a very unique kind of thing and then it reaches. Okay. This is for chlorophyll A, the green color. And for chlorophyll B, it is slightly different. So the chlorophyll B is a spectrum and what, what are the significance will come later into that, something like this. Again it follows the same pattern. this is chlorophyll B. So because of that small change, the chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B has a different absorption spectra. The absorption spectra of A and B are different and the light that is not appreciably absorbed by chlorophyll A at 460 nanometer, okay. For example, is captured by chlorophyll B which is intense absorption at that spectrum, okay. So if you look at it at 460, 
in about if I put this as the 460 where you see chlorophyll B is doing better than chlorophyll A. So thus these two kind of chlorophyll complement each other in absorbing the incident light. So this kind of a complementation of A and B. So they are complementing each other in absorbing light and the spectral region from 500 to 600 is only weakly absorbed by this chlorophyll and this is something very strange. If you look at this part, there is hardly any absorbance taking place at that point. But this does not pose a problem for most green plants. By the contrast, the light is often limiting factor for cyanobacteria or blue green algae and red algae, okay, because they possess accessory, the, the way it is being done, the spectral region between 500 and 600 is only weakly absorbed by this chlorophyll, but this does not pose a problem for most green plants. By contrast, Light is often a limiting factor for cyanobacteria, blue-green algae and red algae. We will discuss about this matter, why is it so? Okay. Especially these plants possess accessory light harvesting pigments that enable them to trap light that are not absorbed strongly by the chlorophyll or photosynthetic organism lying above them. So essentially this is the region where several accessory pigments could be helpful to absorb light, okay. So we will come into this aspect that where this whole complementation thing starts in the chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. As a matter of fact, just to give you a hint, photosystem consists of two parts, photosystem 1 and photosystem 2. This photosystem 1 and photosystem 2 are two light harvesting spots or you can call them the hot spots of light harvesting. These two spots have differential composition of photosystem A and photosystem B. In other words, there is different ratio. Say for example, if I put A as B as a ratio, so there is a ratio of photosystem in photosystem 1, they have a different ratio as compared to photosystem 2. And this difference in the ratio leads to different form of light absorbance at photosystem 1 and photosystem 2. We will come later and once we enter into the photosystem 1 and photosystem 2. But I wish you to really look at this wonderful molecule which nature has evolved. Just imagine how much orderliness nature has done to synthesize a molecule like this. And this is what I always been pointing out all throughout the course. There is an order out of chaos. Things have been put in an order by some self-assembled forces and that is what the energetics is all about, bioenergetics, where energy has been used to make extraordinarily beautiful molecules. I will close in here. In the next class, we will move on with the photon absorbance and the reaction centers.